Good morning. Reading from the Gospel of Mark this morning, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. The beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord and make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Hello. Good morning. Thank you. That's a brief summation of me, John the Baptist. You know, my name is, you call me John the Baptist. Is this a Baptist church? Or am I in the wrong place? No, I, I occasionally get out to you Methodists. But uh, no, my name is John, and that's a very important part of my past. But, you know, more importantly than that, I want to just tell you this before I begin this. Um, I was once asked, am I Elijah the prophet? And, and you know, am I, who, who are you? You know, and I simply said, I'm a voice. Just a voice. A voice. But I am sent from God with a message. You heard some of that message and uh, delivered to you from God's holy word, the holy Bible as you now call it. But you can read about me and every one of those gospels written by friends or friends of friends, the gospels of Matthew, of Mark, of Luke, and of John, you'll find some very, very heartfelt, important information that don't point to me, but point to the one who I was preparing the way for, my cousin Jesus. That's the most important part of my message. For he comes bringing the Spirit, he comes bringing the true baptism of love and repentance of, of changing that can come into your life and you can have the joy and the peace that you need and I believe every heart deep down desires. But I want to pray before we begin. Can we do that together? God, you have had a message that you wanted me to deliver this morning of repentance and of love and always point to Jesus. I pray I can do that this morning. I pray that for this beautiful, loving group that has gathered here to worship and glorify you on this day. So, Lord, may we be at oneness with you through this time together. Amen. Amen. You, know, I, you know a little bit about my background, maybe. I think your pastor, back in December, shared a bit about my parents. Love my parents. Dearly devoted, priestly families. You know their names, remember? Zachariah. Elizabeth. They were getting up there in years and thought, no, no children, no children. So, so heartbroken over that, but had resolved to that. And then one day a big old angel showed up when my daddy was in the temple offering the sacrifice. <laughs> if you think that didn't startle him, it was, that wasn't half of it. That wasn't even a fraction of what that angel was about to tell my father, that they were going to have a child at their old age. Yeah, with God, all things possible. And Dad found that out. And boy, Mom really found it out. But my dad kind of held, you know, pulled back and he said, are you kidding me? I don't know about that. And with that, zipped his lips. 
Some of you might like that for your spouse. I don't know. But for nine months, my dad couldn't speak because the angel said, you will not speak. You'll not speak. But when your son is born, you're going to give him the name John. And he will be a messenger, for he will be the forerunner of the one that is to come. To usher in the kingdom of God, to tell others about Jesus, and to offer good news. So I went around about, uh, well, I went, one, there's another part to that puzzle. That You know what? That same angel went north. Gabriel went a little bit up the road, a few miles, to visit my, my um, dear mother's cousin, Mary, much younger than my mother. And told her some news that would even a little bit different. That she too would have a child and his name would be Jesus. For he would save them from their sins. There was once when they got together. Uh, both of them pregnant and, and they had a, a great time together. And whenever I, I heard, I, now I don't remember this. But when I was in the womb and Mary's voice was spoken and I immediately... <laughs> started doing cartwheels in my mother's womb. I don't know if she appreciated that a whole while, but that was kind of my personality. A little boisterous, a little bit out there, a little different than your normal son, and, and um, that was okay. That was okay. Well, I raised, my, my daddy raised me, taught me great things and, and such, and then, you know, there were some things that in my life that were just different. One day, my father came to me when I was starting to get a little older in my life, and he came to me and he said, Son, when you were a little boy, and I was holding you as a young child, I wrote down some things that I had prayed over you, some things that were, I knew were going to have an impact in your life. And these things really worked on me. And I want to share some of the things my father, these are from my dad, he prayed over me. He said this to me, he said, You, my son... You, my son, are going ahead of the Lord and will make everyone ready for him. He also wrote, You, my son, are going to tell them, tell everyone that they can have their sins forgiven. You're going to tell them that God's kindness and God's love will shine on them like the rising sun. I kept this and began to work on me. Began to, I don't know, just put a weight on my heart and my life. What am I going to do with this? How am I going to deal with this? What's, what's up? What's, what's God? How's God really going to use me? So I had to leave. That weight became too heavy and I just needed to separate myself from everyone. So I went down near the Dead Sea out into the wilderness. And I was in the wilderness, kind of alone for a while, and began to take things to heart that were going on around me in a, in a troubled Israel, in a troubled world. And the wilderness I was in pointed to so many people being in a wilderness, where they were directionless. They were no peace. They didn't know where to turn, who to turn to, where to go. That weight became heavier and heavier. So I went back and looked at my words that Dad had prayed over me and I knew it pointed to God. Baptism had been a tradition, but it was not really fulfilling anyone's life. So I began to preach a baptism of change, which means repentance. When, when one repents, it means you must begin to have a change in your life. And with change, you should begin to bear some fruit of that change. And I'll speak just a little bit more to that in a moment, but to have true change. So I started, you know, and I was a little wild looking. I mean, I'm nothing compared to what I was then, living out in the wilderness all those years by myself. And have you ever tried grasshoppers or locusts? They're a little crunchy, <laughs> a little dry. You put a little honey on them, they're not too bad, but... You know, there's better things to eat, but... So I was a little wild looking, a little wild acting. But yet, when I got out there and started preaching and, and you know, I was near the, at that time, near the Dead Sea, I started baptizing people. I had no formal training or anything, but I, I knew that it was right that people needed to come to God. So I started baptizing and saying, repent! 
For the kingdom of God is near. Right. Repent. And you know what? People loved it. People wanted to hear that. They wanted that change in their life because they were in the wilderness. They were directionless and they knew change needed to take place in their life. And they started coming. And it wasn't me. I mean, those words were simple. And I didn't look very, you know, I wasn't a beautiful preacher out there saying those things. I was just a voice. Just a voice. I worked my way up to the, into the Jordan River because, you know, there were, there were more people wanted, wanted to come. And so I, I was in the Jordan River. You know, it was like whenever I started, when I started preaching or I started telling, it was like a swarm of bees was coming out of my mouth. It just kind of busted loose. That people came. And you know some of the others who came? They looked up one day and there were these priests and they were in our day called Pharisees and Sadducees. They had a high, high opinion of themselves. Low opinion of everybody else. They're kind of the formal church people, if you want to call it today. And I kind of held them to account because Israel had strayed so far. And yet they weren't telling people to return to God. They were just charging them fees. And, you know, if they wanted to sacrifice, well, it cost you this much. It was just so much contrary to, to God's word. <laughs> so I lambasted them. That's not a, always popular. You know, they had a lot of control, a lot of clout, a lot of power. They were called somebody a brood of vipers? You get away with it? That's kind of like snakes slithering in the grass. And snakes slithering in the grass can also be consumed by the fire. And that's what I told them. The fires would, would consume them if they didn't change from their ways. And true repentance meant, meant more than just going through the motions. It meant truly bearing fruit, having a fruit of change taking place in your life. And that's good advice for all you. If you've been baptized, if you've, you've come before and accepted God in your life, show that change not, not just to, to God, but to everybody. So people would come and, you know, I'd, I'd already spoken about some of the faults in those uh, uppity people. And... Uh, but the common folks, they kept coming. And so they began to ask me what they could do. And um, I told uh, some of them, I said this, I, well, it's kind of like this. You want to change to bear some fruit? He said, you know, I'm looking out there. I see a, this is comparative to today. I see a barrel out there. And it says collecting shoes for Hey, hey, hi, hey, I don't know that word. I don't know that place. Hey, Haiti or someplace? But if you've got 73 pairs of shoes in your closet, you know, you probably don't need all those. Although I used, if you've got two cloaks, give one to somebody that doesn't have one. So if you've got some extra shoes, give some to somebody that doesn't have any. You know, if, if someone needs food, and I think you've done that most recently, a couple of weeks ago, someone needs food, then why not share with your abundance? So that's, that's bearing fruit of change, being outwardly looking. But tax collectors came. You know, it's always in Scripture. I know we like to pick on the tax collectors. I, so they asked me, what, what can we do to change? So I told the tax collector, just charge what you're supposed to. Don't try to get anything extra. Just be fair to one another. Just be fair. And that's pretty good advice in anything that you do. Then the Roman, some Roman soldiers even came. Roman soldiers, you know, and they were at risk in doing this, but they came wanting to be baptized. And they said, what can we do? I said, just said, don't extort people. Don't make up things about them that aren't true. Don't do, bear false accusations against people. Another good advice for all of us. But, you know, simple because they were ruthless and overpowering and overbearing. So just simple ways of making your baptism, living out your faith and living out your baptism. So it, and it's not all that hard. I don't believe for anyone. Remember, my, I was just a voice just to give a simple, simple message of repentance, of change, and returning to God. Then one day I was out, most exciting time when I was out there doing this, and, and I looked off in the distance, and I see another man walking towards me by himself. And I didn't recognize, but I looked at him, and it just struck me. I said, there's the Lamb of God. It takes away the sins of the world. I 
and you have something up there that's as worthy as a lamb, you know. In our day, the lamb was sacrificed, but just killing a lamb really was having no impact on anyone. It wasn't changing their life. That person I knew could change lives. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. As he got closer, I recognized that he was my cousin Jesus. He comes walking up to me, and as I'd been baptizing, and everybody kind of separates, and he comes right up to me. And he says, now John, baptize me. And I knew this man. I knew his heart. I knew I'd been around him and heard, of course, all the loving stories of how he cared for others. And I said, no, 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 no. You should, you should baptize me. I, I'm not even worthy to carry your sandals, to wipe the dust. I, you know, just use me to wipe the dust off your sandals. I, I can't. Don't, don't ask me to baptize. He said, yeah, that's right. That you were, that, then in order that all righteousness be fulfilled, that you do this. And I thought about that for a minute in, in hindsight, looking back, righteousness. You know, he who was out without sin, willing to take on our sin on that cross later in his life. Of course, I wasn't around at that time, but he who without sin, willing to take on and give us his righteousness. Give it to us. Give us his righteousness. We're not worthy of that. We're not, we don't earn that, but yet he was willing to give it give us something we couldn't attain on our own. He identified with every one of us. Every one of those common folks, every one of those people who came down to that river, he, he knew our plight, he knew us, he identified with our, our own plight and wanted to give us something we couldn't gain on our own and that's him, himself, his righteousness. So I, I said, yes, Lord, and I baptized him and as I, he was coming up out of the water, immediately I, I saw a dove. And then the heavens opened and a voice cried out that said, never forget, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. A voice from heaven said that, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. I can't. That message is for all of you as well. You, you are his child and he is well pleased with all of you. He loves you, cares about you. He gave himself for you. You know, immediately when that happened, it's like, you know, I mentioned earlier this part of this message from God that, that it says, you know, shine on them like the rising sun that just sh shined on him. The rising sun, it's like that he glowed. And I knew immediately at that point that weight that had been on me to go out and give that message was immediately lifted. I knew I had done what I was supposed to do and now, that voice crying from the wilderness that I had would be, has now been given through this Son of God, Jesus. To now offer grace, love, peace, joy, but still repentance. And then one day He would give us that Spirit to live within us, His Spirit to live within us. And Jesus would also go on to preach a message of judgment as well for those who choose not to follow. Friends, I, I believe that message is still alive today. Message of repentance. What my daddy gave to me still lives today. I urge you, this is a, your, your season of the year that is so special to the church and to one another of Lent, of preparation, preparation for Easter, but it's just living in faith. Living in faith, growing in faith, continuing to count upon God, continuing to serve Him, continuing if, through your repentance to bear fruit. I urge you forward. I urge you to, to go on this journey of, uh, uh, together as a church, as, as a people of God. And God is with you. He will never, ever, ever let, leave you. My journey of I went on to do a bit more after that, but would soon take another turn. As I became less, he always becomes more. He always becomes more. I like to pray for you as I close. Lord, these are your people. These are your sons and daughters.
In them you are well pleased. And then you continue to love. Watch over them. Guide their very lives. Teach them to bear the fruits of repentance and show that to others. In the name of my cousin Jesus, I pray. Amen. Peace be with you.